Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's farming program. I'm John Kenyuk, and each week at this time, we bring you topics of interest from the Manx countryside, from Manx farming, from people who work in the industry, people who live in the countryside, and topics of general interest. Usually at this time, a resume of the weather that we've had during this uh, past week, because that usually dictates what's been happening on the farm. Now, if you remember, I think it was last Monday, it was a, a very, very wet day and it's, the ground again is, is sodden. Um, as I travel around, all I see is tracks going into and out of fields where farmers have been carrying bales to stock that are being outwintered uh, and access to them is, is particularly difficult at this point in time. I see some fields, uh, some stubble fields uh, and lay fields being ploughed uh, because actually the spring is almost upon us, even though the weather may not say so. Um, the season is upon us and some people are beginning already to make preparations for that. You'll have heard me say many times on this programme that family farming is something with which many of us grew up and were very familiar but sadly today um, it's something that is disappearing. The mixed family farm where the farmer and his wife and his family lived on the farm, gained their living from the farm, um, was a thing that we all took for granted I'm afraid, uh, but that is fast disappearing. But I caught up on a, on a well-known farming family, a real farming family, and I was privileged to sit at their tea table just as they were finishing tea uh, one night last week. Uh, and you'll all know as soon as I tell you that um, I've come to the home of, well, I'll say Philip and Carol Kermod, but nobody would know if I said Philip Kermod. But if I said Pip Kermod, you would know straight away. Pip, um, you you are you are a dying breed as a family. There, are, there can't be many family farms around you here at Ottersdale either. No, there's um, there was quite a few when when I first came here, and slowly but surely they're disappearing. Mm. Um, I think right around here, you gotta go a long way before you can see a family. It's, it's all on the farm still. Yeah, and yet this this was how we grew up, wasn't it? This is this is this is what we were familiar with. Yeah. Yeah, which is sad, really, because um, you you start now. You, once there were well, we rent two or three different places, and once there was a family in them places. Now we've got a very wealthy uh, farmer, not a farmer, landowner. landowners in there, and uh, well, you hardly know them. Mm. You know they're, they're here, and uh, yeah. they're very wealthy people, but um, no interest at all in farming. No, we're sitting here around a, around a kitchen table in a farm kitchen. Uh, this is really the nerve centre, Pip. It is, it is in our house anyway, and I imagine it is in yours. This is where the the big decisions are made, isn't it? Oh, this is it. It's, <laughs> no, I, this is where it gets uh, a bit hot and heavy sometimes. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's the farm in the kitchen. It's uh, where a lot of business is done, and Aye. anybody wants to come in, uh, any of the reps, anything like that, they come in, get a cup of tea, and they get paid hopefully, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's where it is, and yeah. It's, it's... But sitting across the table from us, Carol, um, Pip's wife, Carol. Carol, you, you're totally involved in in the farm here, aren't you? This 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 is your life. Yes. Oh, yes. I, ever so well, I was born and brought up here, and then when we got married, we started farming in our own right here. But um, yeah, to day to day, like I do lots of. Well, feed the lambs and sort things out like that because we're, we're lambing the pedigrees at the moment. Yeah. But um, with having Caesar, who's only like just under two years old, and he's sitting here with us. A bit. <laughs> he's Carol, being very quiet at the moment. <laughs> Carol, did you did you ever want to do something else? Did you uh, as, as a <coughs> farmer? Many farmers' wives now take jobs outside of farming. Did Did you ever want to? Did you ever feel that that you you should do that? Sometimes you think, you know, you, you see you see them when they've got their outside jobs and they seem to have more disposable income, if you call it, but then again, who'd cook the food and, and just sort of hold it together type of thing? And many a time there can be a cow calving or a sheep lambing and he needs an extra pair of hands. It's easier now that Kiri's left school because she takes on a lot of the work that I used to do. And then when Thomas comes home from school, he does, he does work as well. So it's... Uh, it's handy getting some bigger children as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kerry, you left school now, and and uh, and you've you've come home to work, and that in itself is unusual. Don't don't you find amongst uh, your friends and your contemporaries that uh, you two are a rare breed? Yeah, most of my friends went to banks and uh, did really good jobs with like good wages, but 
they all said I was stupid to come home to the farm where it's a lot cheaper, but it's it's what, what I know is what you like and enjoy is your priority. You've got to stick to what you like. How long is it since you knew that this is what you wanted to do, Kerry? Well, ever since I've been, I don't know, since I've been born, I've always been on the farm. And I don't know, I've liked it ever since then. And it's really enjoyable and I carry on with it. So, so, so how long have you been left school now and, and home working with mum and dad? Um, I've been left a year from school at GCSEs. I left then and um, I had good enough grades to go back, but <laughs> I went for the farming. And I also do a course at Nokalo, like a day release course, mm. but it's really good. Now, did you, like like some of us in, in our time, did you have pressure on you to take an academic career? You said you had good passes in GCSEs. Were you pressurised to take a, an academic career? Well, they wanted me to stay on at school because they thought there's no future in farming. Well, you might say that, but there is, I think. Somewhere out there, there is a future. You've got to work for it. You got it is there if you're a trier. So, so you you have to work it. It'll not yeah. be handed to you on a plate, no, will no, it? No, <laughs> definitely not. Yeah. Thomas, you're you're across the table. You're you're still at school. Um, how, how do you see your future? Will are you likely to to come home and and work here at Arrowsdale with with the family? Yeah, I think so. It's, um, I, I can't see myself staying on at school because I don't really enjoy it that much. Do, and, but do you do you do you enjoy the farm work? Yeah, yeah. Which which part of it is it? Is it the stock or the arable or, or or which part do you enjoy the best? Mainly the stock, they they're the best. But um, I do enjoy the arable at times. It's a it's a a, a variation, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So how much longer have you got to do at school, Thomas? A couple of months left now. All right, so you're on a countdown now. Uh, Are you looking forward to coming home? Yeah. It's not going to be easy because this is a hard work on the family, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You'll be expected to pull your weight. Yeah. <laughs> well, there we are. Pip, if I could come back to you then and uh, and sort of uh, tell us a bit about the, your farming operation here at Otterstale. Um Sort of, you know, the stock you've got because you, you're, you're a stockman and uh, you, you're quite a noted stockman, uh, in fact. So just, we, just what do you run here? Well, we, we run, um, my, my main job is, is the beef cows. That's our main job. Um, we run a lot of Angus Cross cows and uh, we use whatever continental bull fits in with us. It's normally the blue or the limousine. I was just starting to try a few Charolais and um, that's our main job really. And uh, why, why now? There's a, quite a debate about the ideal suckler cow. You seem to have uh, fastened onto the Angus Cross. Um, when you say Angus Cross, crossed with what? Well, the Angus here will be crossed with, um, if you go, it'll be the Hereford, the old Herefords, and um, some of them will be go even going back to the, some of the dairy crosses. Yeah. Um, I've, I personally think I've tried every flipping breed that, that's going, like. <laughs> <laughs> but um, out of the whole lot, we've come right, right round to the Angus, and I can't see a cow that'll, that'll, beat that, that the Angus because she'll calve on her own, she'll get on with the job and um, every year most of them Angus cows will have a calf. Right. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fancy breeds about and there's a lot of uh, you just got to go with the bucket with some of them and keep them going that way. The Angus you don't have to do that the same. Um, and and so do you, do you rear all the calves then? Pip? Yeah, the bulk of them are homebred, homebredly. Um, right. But but do you, will you sell them as stores or will you take them on to finishing? We've been selling uh, as stores. Um, it depends on on the year. Some years, is, uh, if the prices are bad, we'll hold on to them. Like they've been in the past two three years, have been terrible. Um, this last just this last uh, September, we sold and we had a, a good sale. Um, we sold them as stores and they went on to different farmers around the island. Um, I I just feel like. Um, as, as, as long as we put the right product in front of them, mm. um, there's plenty of buyers there. Right. But um, there could be a lot more made out of this Angus job. Um, they've been on these Angus schemes the other side in England, Scotland there for a number of years. And for a number of years now, I've tried to get a scheme up and going here for, for Angus beef. That, that's for people um, breeding uh, specialised Angus for a specialised market. It would be. Aye. Um, on a contract, probably. Yes. And I, I couldn't see for, for the life of me why they didn't pick it up years ago when I asked them. 
Um, it was an opportunity lost to Manx farmers, that was. Mm. I'm not saying every Manx farmer wants to go for an Angus, and they probably wouldn't. But, but there, there was, was a niche market there. There was a market there, and yeah. still is. And uh, yeah. It was a shame the marketing society didn't pick it up. Mm. Now, what? How do you? How do you sort of manage them? Then, do you? Do you is it? It's all your feed homegrown, for example. Yeah, everything's home produced. Um, we've got to keep costs right down. Um, we grow silage, a lot of hay, and uh, most of the cows are outwintered. In fact, all the cows are outwintered. Um, how are you coping in this weather? Because oh, it's not easy, is it? Terrible, terrible muck. Um, we're putting one of these corrals in. We're hoping that'll ease the situation. Um, oh, just just explain then. For uh, I think there might be some farmers even that are not too familiar with uh, with this uh, wood chip corral. Uh, what, what does it consist of? Well, what it is is um, it's a big square area we got. It's two hundred foot by fifty foot, and um, we're hoping to put. Run, run about 100 cows in there. And what they do is uh, they got what uh, this David Brewster from Kirk Michael, he's got a new machine over, just come over this year, and he put the, the timbers from the forestry board through it, trees and stuff, and they come out like big chips the size of a cup. Yeah. yeah. And you, in that area we've got, they, they say it'll take about 300 tonne of chips in there. Right. And you spread that to a depth of between two and three foot, somewhere in there. And then you put your cows on, you rail it off to keep them all in it, and you, and you put your, say, 100 cows on that area, and then all the muck and the wet and all soaks right down through these chips. Right. And the cows, instead of lying in muck and, and, and an old wet hedge just out beside the field, so they, can, they can lie in there, and there's always a bit of heat in the, in the timber, you see, and they always and they're, generate their own warmth. And they're dry. And they're dry. And clean, yeah. 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 And uh, you know where they are, too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so are you ready to, to, to progress this, Pip? Aye, we've we got it just about done. Um, uh, David Bruce today, we're waiting for him to come and do the chips, put the chips in. It's all been dug out, the, the fencing's done, and... Um, it's quite an operation. It's not as cheap as I thought it was going to be. Nothing ever is, is it? No, <laughs> no, and... Um, but I... The, I just hope it'll work. Right. Um, but, I mean, you go out there in the mornings now, we're going out, we're, we're feeding a lot of bales, and you, every time you go across the fields, the cows yeah. follow you. And yeah. What a muck, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And um, that's what we've got to put up with. But now, you, you farm quite a few pieces of land in, in different parts. It's not easy, is it? Um, no. Sort of um, tracking <laughs> between one piece of land and another. Terrible. Terrible. <laughs> uh, well, not just that. You got you got these eleven months um, tenancy acts, and and land and farms are getting changed that fast these days. You, you don't know you're going to be from one year to the next, like, and um, that's that's the downside of it. Um, yeah, it's it is a lot more running around. Mm, mm. But if there's more money in the job, you put big sheds up, like, and but there's, there's, the money's not in it to, no, no. to justify it. Now you said uh, beef cattle were your main enterprise, but you run sheep as well. Aye, we got a, a lot of commercial sheep cr across Suffolk, across Texels, and then we got a small flock of um, Texels pedigree. Yeah, um, that's what we produce the tops for the for the market for yeah, the sales here. Yeah. We do well out of them. Done uh, very well this year. Um, they're a, they're a good hard breed. We we enjoy. It's a it's a little bit of a sideline for us, and uh, we, everybody gets a bit of fun out of it. <laughs> now, as, as I understand, I think I think Kerry is, is smiling. Kerry, you you get involved with the textiles, don't you? Yeah. Do you, do you like the sheep better than the cattle? No, I prefer the cattle. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> right. But no, the textiles are really good. They're nice. Um, they're a bit dopey at times, but. That's acceptable, I suppose, when they do well for us. Do you, do you like following up the pedigree side of it and, and, yeah. and watching the, the, the pedigree lines coming through? Yeah, I think I think that's really good. It's a big family line and that's what you want. If you know something's doing well, you continue it, but if you don't, get rid and you can do it right the way down through the lines. Right. Yeah. And who looks after the pedigree side with the paperwork? Do you do that? Or? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm trying to learn now, but Mum does all that. She's, <laughs> <laughs> she's a brainy one. <laughs> Carol, if you, if you do the paperwork, I would have thought farmers had enough paperwork to do without going into pedigree certificates and all the rest of it. It, it. There's a lot of work now in that area, isn't there? Oh, yes. I mean, you've got passports for ev every animal, every cat, beast you've got. And then now they're going to tag all the older cows and from this spring onwards. The what what do you as 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 the as the person on on the farm that does the paperwork then as is the case on many family farms what what do you think of the extra tagging of cows that we're likely to face in July? Oh, um, 
I think it might. Um, these cows, the older cows, you know them anyway. There's not that many of them now, really, in a lot of herds. And um, you're going to take that cow's number that she's already got and give her a totally new identity. Mm. And I don't know how, I mean, it'll take some following up, really, mm. in some ways. In, in administration terms, she, she is, in fact, a different cow, isn't she? Yes, yeah. I which, mean, which is hard to understand. Yeah, it, it, it <laughs> takes a bit of understanding. But yes, like, if she's, like... Nora's number one six eight now. She might be a totally different number. She might be seven double oh three nine six next next year, and it's, it'll take some altering all you. So, so Carol, what what proportion of your time do you spend then uh, doing paperwork? You do the pedigree certificates for for the Texels, and uh, and I know you're import pedigree stock uh, cattle as well. Mm -hmm. um, must take up a lot of your time. I'd say, yeah. Say we bring cattle in, it takes you an afternoon to sort through all the pedigrees and the, um, apply for new Manx passports from their old passports from away. Um, to do the, the lambs, you keep up to date, you take the mother's ear number and, and then you have to write down exactly what she's had and keep, keep that up. But the Texel Society this year are issuing personalised um, birth notifications so each sheep is it's made it a little bit easier because you've got the actual sheep's ear number and things down on one side and all you've got to do is say is she had males and females and triplets or twins or whatever so that makes it a bit easier but um no it takes a while really do, do you enjoy it well <laughs> once i get started it's all right it's just the getting started of it all do, do you do, have you got a nat natural aptitude for for desk work though uh, oh. Does it come easy to you? Kiri's nodding her head. She seems <laughs> to think so. But uh, no, well, years ago I didn't. I didn't think very much about being in the house and doing all this paperwork and what have you. But you've got to do it now, yeah. because more and more, if you haven't got it right, you're, you're up a gum tree. You've got yeah. to do it. That's right. Because uh, the, it's amazing what uh, the department can actually find out anyway. Yeah. So. Pip, what would what would it mean to you if <coughs> if Carol wasn't doing the paperwork? I'd pack up. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> right out of the hand. The whole job's That's out of hand. I feel um, we got um, there's more uh, passports for for cattle and, and identities for cattle than there is for people now. Yeah. Um, could could you cope? Could no, you cope with, with the paperwork? I no. wouldn't even start. No, I wouldn't even start. <laughs> that's brought a laughter yeah. from round this table. I can tell, but I I know exactly what what Pip is saying because I would echo sentiments completely. Only only Margaret does our paperwork at home. There is no way that that um, no. that uh, we could cope with it and do the outside uh, management and and work as well. So it it is a very very important uh, aspect of of farming today, and and really it's difficult to see how it relates to farming. It, it is. It's. it's the trouble is they, they bring a new idea up every now and again. Well, it's more often than ever now. And they think you got enough time to bring these schemes. There's a scheme they dream up, and they think you can just do it with the flick of a switch. So you, mm. I mean, we're doing well to keep up with what we've got, yeah. the way it is. And without adding more and more, um, they're, they're talking about tagging lambs and sheep. Yes. And I mean, it's getting to a stage where the fun's going out of the job. Yes. And this, this is all over and above the actual business that's side right. of the farm, the but, accounting but, and, and all the rest of it, mm. which is a job enough in itself. Well, it's a full-time job, really, and only the Carol is smart doing it. Um, well, we wouldn't be in no. the job. And there's a lot of um, farmers, they're strolling with the farm, and that's bad enough, and then you got to finish a day's work and then go in the house, and unless you've been writing down in a notebook or something, you're absolutely lost. That's it. right. And it's all for nothing. That's right. I well, think that's the frustrating part, mm, Pip, isn't it? That's right. We can, yeah. There's no real benefit at the end, except that we'll be able to export or whatever. But at, at the end, it doesn't improve the no, the stock no. or None improve the all. price at all, does it? If we were getting, uh, we see an incentive to get more out of the job by going that a bit extra, but yeah, we're told to do it and get on with it, and yeah. it's not as. I don't think they're realising the pressure they're putting us under. Right. I'm, I'm sure they don't. No, I don't. I'm yeah. convinced yeah. of it. I mean. Yeah. Carol, um, you're saying you're doing the paperwork, and and you've got Caesar here uh, alongside you, and and he's he's putting his two pennies into this program as well. And I make no apology for that because that's what family farming is. You, but you you don't just do paperwork, Carol. You do outside work as well, don't you? Yes. Yeah. So so what happens? To, how old is Caesar, for example? Well, he'll be two in 
May, at the beginning of May. Yeah, I mean, he comes out in the morning, we, we have a breakfast and get tidied up in here and then he gets his water cruise on the same as the rest of us <laughs> and too. comes down the yard. <laughs> It's like this morning he ended up in a, in a big muddy puddle and he had to be brought back up the house and get changed. But he'll he'll carry buckets and potter around and put feed where it shouldn't go. And <laughs> Thomas, do, do you remember starting off like that where, where, where Caesar is now? Where, where you brought out onto the yard and, and sort of... I know our girls were and, and sort of farmers' families did generally. Yeah, I was. I was dragged out everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Do you regret that now? <laughs> no, not one bit, no. You don't? No. Do you ever feel you were deprived or that you were uh, disadvantaged because you lived on a farm and uh, and we do go about in muck and we go about in wellies, don't we? D did you ever feel that uh, you were a bit unfortunate in that respect? No, not really. Um, people saw me as I was and they got used to me and it, that's it. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you're, you're quite happy with it and content with it now. And yeah. more than that, Thomas, you, you're prepared to look forward now at your age and say you're prepared to make a career of this. Yeah, that's it. And, and if anybody ever went into it with their eyes open, you are. Uh, it, you're not going to get any shocks or surprises. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pip, if I come back again, um, you've, uh, you've been responsible for uh, providing quite a bit of pedigree stock in the island over the past few years. I remember you having a notable success at the uh, at the Royal Manx. Uh, was it millennium year? That's right, eighty nine. Yeah, we went. Uh, yeah, we went to the show. We weren't expecting to win anything. We won a class. We'd be doing well. We thought, and that's genuine. And uh, um, I never forget the morning really, because it, it was a beautiful morning. And uh, I put my suit down for a right good laugh with Carol. I said, I'm going to meet the Queen today. And she said, don't be so stupid. <laughs> so I said, all right, I won't. And uh, anyway, I got myself, gave me old clothes, and after the show we went, God, I couldn't believe it. Just, just the way it turned out. It was... And here above the fireplace in, in, in this kitchen is, is the very picture, Pip. Yeah, I got a, I got a shock when I, when I met the Queen. But... And she's presenting you there with the Johnson Rose Bowl. That's it. That's the Supreme it. Award yeah, at the show, Pip. Yeah, yeah. she was a... Uh, she, she surprised me more than anything. Uh, she was a really down-to-earth type of person, she was. She, yeah. she was nice with it, you know, she was... Uh, no, um, I thought she'd be a lot posher and more, you know. <laughs> no, she was just like talking here and now. So, so which was the best part of it then? Was it, was it winning the Rose Bowl or meeting the Queen? Well, I didn't think I was going to meet the Queen, really. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, I was just beating Ron Collins, that was a favourite. <laughs> Right, yeah. and and you've you've been into pedigree stock then. I mean, just recently, uh, you know, you've brought bulls onto the island. You went away to Perth and uh, to the Angus bull sales, and you brought stock back home. Um, is there a demand on the island for that then, Pim? There is a there is a strong demand for for quality cattle on the island. Um, it's it's the transport in now was just the big killer off that job. But uh, really speaking, it'd be better if they were they were bringing females in and bred the the bulls here. Which is a you know a lot of farmers is doing that now, mm. and uh, the standard of, of stock has come up. Yeah, um, we, we've got a high standard of stock here. If you look over the last five ten years, there's an awful lot of quality cattle coming to the Isle of Man. I mean, um, expensive cattle, but the, them them quality of them cattle is still here, and they're, they're starting to come through in the bulls now. So in a number of years, really, there won't be the same need to go away for bulls. There should be enough Manx bulls bred here. And pedigree, pedigree stock yeah, on the island. Yeah. You'll always have to go away and renew a bit of uh, new bloodlines. Yeah. But um, no, there, there'll be some real good herds of uh, stock here. Right. Whatever breed, you know. Um, well, that, that's another thing. Is, is, is there a preference for, for anyone? I mean, you brought several different breeds in fairly recently. Is there a preference maybe? For no, them? no. Uh, you might like the, I might like, like the Angus and some of would hate them, but... No, there's no real set uh, breed, and um, whatever, and you can think what you like. You won't change any of uh, their minds. Uh, it's what they like, and it's what they want, and uh, you either supply it or you don't. Mm. As simple as mm. that. Um, mm. And whatever breed there is, there's a lot of good bulls here. There is a lot of good bulls getting bred on the island, and. Um, it, it does seem ironic, though, that you're saying that, and I know it's, what you're saying is absolutely right, that the quality of stock has improved out of all recognition on the Isle of Man. <coughs> Isn't it ironic, then, that we're actually getting less for it now than we were when, it, when it, the quality wasn't quite as good? That's right. Absolutely shocking. Uh, the price we're getting 
actual from the, the market at the minute is roughly around about 130, 150 a kilo. That's what Manx farmers are picking up from the market. Okay. Um, and when I was, which is which is about sixty pence a pound. That's yes, yeah. And I went to the supermarkets. So I don't go very often, but I got when I get there, I get down that meat counter and have a look. And this works out roughly between six, seven, well upwards a kilo pounds. Pound a kilo. I mean, uh, I mean they say in. Uh, there's no money in agriculture. It was not going to be, but that's the mm. little bit they're giving us out of it. Mm. Do you find it as I do, and I do exactly what you do, Pip? Um, if uh, it's not often I go to a supermarket, but when I do, I go to the meat counter, and I look at the prices. It actually hurts me oh. to see how much the the housewife is being charged. That she's being charged so much when we're getting so little. That's right. Absolutely, it's, it, it's hurtful. Well, it's, she's she's. I mean, it's hurtful for us, but she's also paying twice mm. because. Um, we do, we get a subsidy. Thank God we do get a subsidy, which brings uh, from one thirty one fifty to just under the one eighty, maybe to two pounds somewhere in there a kilo. Yeah. Then she goes to the supermarket expecting to buy cheap meat. Yeah. And she's paying again. Yeah. So she's paying twice really, yeah. and um, it's right out of our hands. There's nothing we can do about it, and um, that's the that's the downside of it. And and the other part that seems to be that that that, that is a bit sickening is we owned we owned the product in the first place. That's right. I am, um, and then we lose control of it. Total, total control. Yeah, um, yeah. So, but but Pip, if, having said all that, um, you're still putting new buildings up. You're putting new facilities up for cattle. You're importing pedigree stock. You, you're obviously going ahead. You, you, it just it hasn't deterred you. No, it's just what I've been brought up with, and and we've always in. It's, it's, it gets past the stage of enjoying, because uh, you've got to make you've got to make ends meet as well. It's, it's not just uh, out there and all mixing in and having a good day of it. You've got to make ends meet. Um, I don't know whether we will, at the present rate, I mean, it's only so big you can get anyway. Um, I, I feel we're big enough the way it is. But, I mean, um, to, to be able to handle the job and, and enjoy it, it's, it's only so big you can get and mm. only so big you'll want to get. Yeah. Um, at the present rate, you're the same. We got to compete on a world market. I mean, I mean, how, how some of these big feedlots have got twenty five, thirty thousand cattle in them. Yes. I mean, how do you really compete with that? That's right. uh, and still maintain the fabric of an agricultural industry that's right. here on the Isle of Man. Yes, I mean, mm. I suppose if you took it to the extreme, we could get one or two feedlots set up in the Isle of Man yeah, and yeah. forget the family farm, yeah. forget all the small units, and. Uh, just have half a dozen big units. Is that, is that what the government really wants? It would be a very different Isle of Man, wouldn't it? Well, oh, it'd be a disaster, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd be the a very different Isle of Man. The community's already lost yeah. in farming. Yeah. Now, Pip, here we are talking like this and looking at the future with some apprehension and some fears, and yet your, your two two members of your family, Thomas and Kerry, have both come home to work. Have you encouraged them to come home and work with you? Um, no, and that's the truth. I tried to get Kerry to go into an office, into a bank, and she wouldn't go. She's as stubborn as a mule. <laughs> but, uh, but apart from that, no, I, I tried, and um, and thank God she didn't go, really, because, to be quite honest, we couldn't cope now. Right. Um, financially, we're, we're making ends meet. Um, she gets a wage out of it. It's nothing like what she can get. The other her friends are all getting. Mm. Um, we're just hoping things will get better yeah and thomas will follow her then so you'll have you'll have two if your yeah. family will, and yeah. then you will be a real family farm that's yep. right i i mean we do enjoy it we get on well and uh there's never a day go past with, before i'm told off like i'm getting told off a lot oh, we all, we're all used to that we, <laughs> we, we all we all put up with that <laughs> i'm sure you've done an awful lot right and really we must we must finish there because we've come to the end of our time but i'm sure i could sit at this table and talk to this family and indeed i i, I hope to be back someday just to plot your progress especially the younger members of the family to see how well you are fitting in and i'm sure you will and you'll make a very very successful enterprise of this as in fact is the case now but for for the time being Pip, Carol, Kiri and Thomas and Caesar across the table thank you all very very much for allowing me to come and join you here at the end of your tea time uh, and recording this programme there we are ladies and gentlemen that's all we have time for this week and this is John Kenyuk signing off until next week's programme <laughs>